Thanks for the introduction. So this is joint work with uh, Guillaume Castagnos, Dario Catalano, Fabien Laguiomi, and Federico Savasta. So I'm going to explain how we um, build a generic construction for two-party ECDSA from hash-proof systems and how we efficiently instantiate these from class groups. So before I go into the details, let me give you some intuition for why this work is of practical interest. Actually. So ECDSA stands for um, Elliptic Curve Digital Signature Algorithm. So it's a standardized digital signature algorithm which um, relies on elliptic curve cryptography. And it's the signature which is used um, in Bitcoin cryptocurrency to validate transactions. In particular, this means that if someone steals your secret signing key, they can spend your Bitcoins. So we have this single point of failure which we'd like to avoid. And this is where a distributed version of ECDSA saves the day. So by sharing the key among multiple devices, we not only reduce the risk of key theft, but we also enable cryptocurrency custody solutions where you, could, where you need multiple parties to cooperate in order to perform sensitive operations. So we focus on the two-party setting. So this would allow you, for instance, to share your secret key between your phone and your laptop. So the secret signing key is shared between two parties, P1 and P2, such that collaboratively, P1 and P2 can sign any message. But alone, neither party should be able to forge signatures or learn anything about the reconstructed secret key. So for other signature algorithms, efficient solutions have been around for a long time, in particular for Schnorr algorithms, whose um, elliptic curve variant is very similar to ECDSA. Efficient solutions have been around since the 90s. But devising a two-party ECDSA scheme has proved much more challenging. And let me give you some intuition why. So we'll compare the Schnorr uh, signing algorithm to the ECDSA signing algorithm. For both schemes, um, the public parameters are the group of points of an elliptic curve, G, of prime order Q and generated by P. The secret key is a random X sampled from ZQ, and the public key is X multiplied by the generator P. So as you can see, in the Schnorr signing algorithm, uh, all the steps are linear. The only nonlinear step is the hashing of the message, but since both parties know the message, this isn't going to be a problem. However, if we look at the ECDSA signing algorithm, so things are very similar up until we compute um, S here, and we need to multiply by the inverse of K. And computing this inverse of K is what makes things really complicated. So imagine we wanted to just additively share X and K. For Schnorr, everything works fine. Each party can compute, can sh sorry, each party can sample a share of X and a share of K. And they can each um, compute a share of the signature, which they just then need to add up to get the overall signature. On the other hand, for ECDSA, it's really unclear how we can efficiently compute K minus one, I mean the inverse of K from additive shares of K. So before um, I go any further, let me give you an idea of where we're heading. So I'll first talk about previous work in this field, and in particular that which we build upon. Um, and I'll outline the, the drawbacks that this, these works have. Um, in particular, the reliance on a non-standard interactive assumption. I'll explain how we remove this assumption by using um, uh, hash-proof systems. And, uh, I'll provide the generic construction that we give and um, prove its security. And finally, I'll um, explain how we instantiate this generic construction from class groups, um, which allows us to remove range proofs and uh, significantly, significantly improve our communication cost. So previous work. Um, in gray on this timeline, there's some work in the uh, full threshold case. Um, so some great work has been done in this field recently, but since once restricted to the two-party setting, these yield less efficient protocols. I won't go into the details here. Um, at IEEE S&P, uh, Donner et Al um, put forth a scheme in a two out of N scheme, which is fast, but it relies on oblivious transfer, so it has quite high communication cost. Um, and we wanted to avoid that. So the work that we build upon essentially started at Crypto 2001 with McKinsey and Rater. So they had the idea of multiplicatively sharing X and K. Um, and then they use the linear 
homomorphic properties of the Balier encryption scheme in order to reconstruct uh, the signature. The problem with their work is that for each signature, they need to perform expensive zero-knowledge proofs of knowledge in order to prove that the ciphertexts are well-formed. Um, much more recently, at Crypto 2017, Lindell came up with a great idea which allows to remove all expensive zero-knowledge proofs on the signature algorithm so that they're only done once at key generation. So this is great improvement, but there are still some drawbacks in his work, in particular due to the fact that the Balier encryption scheme has a composite order message space, whereas the elements we're going to be encrypted live encrypting live mod Q. Um, he needs to use range proofs. And he also needs to introduce um, in his security proof artificial aborts. Um, and uh, when he's proving security in the simulation-based model, he also actually introduces a very ad hoc interactive assumption, which I'll talk a bit more about later. So since we build upon Lindell's work, I'll explain at a high level how his protocol works. So recall that our problem is that of jointly computing S. And so P1 and P2 each have a multiplicative share of X and K, and they can set up the public key Q and the randomness R via simulatable Diffie-Hellman key exchanges. And if we um, call this part of the message here S prime, notice that all operations relative to X1 are linear. So if P2 has an encryption of X1 that was sent to him by P1, it can compute an encryption of S prime using the linear homomorphic properties of Bellu. And then if it sends this encryption of S prime back to P1, P1 can decrypt, multiply by his share of K, and then he gets S. And it gets better because um, actually since X1 is sampled at key generation, P1 is going to um, send an encryption of X1, a proof that what he encrypted is indeed the same X1 as that used to compute Q, and a range proof to P2, but he only needs to do these proofs once at key generation. He doesn't have to do anything afterwards. And now every time that P1 and P2 want to collaboratively sign a message, P1 can just compute an encryption of S prime using his freshly sampled K2, send this encryption of S prime to P1, who can decrypt to recover S prime, multiply by his share of K, and he gets the signature. And P2 doesn't have to perform any proofs that he performed the correct homomorphic operations because P1 can just use the public verification algorithm to check that the signature is valid. If it's valid, then he just outputs this signature. Otherwise, he aborts. Okay, so this is great, but there are still some issues. In particular, um, due to the fact that we're using Pallier, um, in the Balier crypto system, your challenger isn't allowed to use the, isn't allowed to know the secret key. Otherwise, the algorithm is, algorithmic assumption doesn't hold anymore. And so in the security proof, when we're simulating P1 against a malicious P2, we can't actually decrypt to check whether um, the signature is valid, and we can't check that P2 performed the correct operations. And so in the game-based proof, the way Lindell deals with this is he just guesses if and when player two cheats. So we have a security loss which is proportional to the number of signatures that our ECDSA um, adversary is allowed to query from its oracle. Um, in the simulation-based proof, this guessing doesn't work, so Lindell introduces a non-interactive, sorry, an interactive and non-standard assumption, um, which basically states that um, security for the Bellier encryption scheme still holds even if the adversary has access to an oracle which tells you if a given ciphertext is a linear combination of the challenge ciphertext. Um, and then the other problem is that, um, as mentioned earlier, the Balier message space is of composite order, whereas we're encrypting elements mod Q, and so we need range proofs to ensure that no wraparounds occur. So in our work, we wanted to um, provide a two-party protocol for ECDSA, which um, doesn't rely, well, which is efficient, both in terms of computational complexity and in terms of bandwidth, which doesn't require any non-standard interactive assumptions, um, and which has a tight security proof. So to this end, we need a linearly homomorphic encryption scheme where security doesn't rely on uh, the challenger not knowing the secret key. 
And if we can further have an encryption scheme where the message space is of prime order, then um, we can remove the range proofs. So we achieve this by using uh, homomorphic linearly homomorphic encryption schemes from hash proof systems. And uh, when we instantiate this generic construction with um, a hash proof system from class groups, uh, we can also remove um, the range proofs. So let's first see how we remove this uh, interactive assumption. So we do this using hash proof systems. Hash proof systems were introduced by Kramer and Shu at Eurocrypt 2002 um, as a means of efficiently computing um, both chosen plaintext and chosen ciphertext secure encryption schemes. So security in this setting relies on the hardness of a subgroup membership problem. So we have this finite abelian group X, which contains a subgroup L, which uh, defines an NP language. And as such, uh, there's a witness set W, which uh, defines this NP language. Um, and the hardness of the problem requires that, given a random element sampled from X, it's hard to tell if it's in the language or not. And so in this context, we have two ha hashing algorithms, one which works over any element in the whole group X, and which takes as input a secret key and hashes an element in X, and another hashing algorithm um, here, which takes as input a public key, an element in the language, and the associated witness, and outputs a hash. And correctness um, imposes that both algorithms should evaluate to the same value if they're evaluated over elements in the language. So from this, we can, well, they devise uh, encryption schemes. So to encrypt an element, basically you just sample a random element from the language with the associated witness. You use the public projective hashing algorithm to compute a hash of X, and you use this to mask um, your encoding of the message. So I've encoded the message in the exponent of F because we want a linearly homomorphic encryption scheme, but the idea is just that you're masking the message. Um, and then you return uh, your masked message and the element of the language, but not the witness. And so now the decryptor who knows the secret key can compute the same hash value using the secret key and the element X and can remove this mask to recover the message. And clearly, um, knowing the secret key here doesn't actually help solve the underlying algorithmic assumption. With the secret key, you can evaluate the hash function over any element in X, but it doesn't help you tell if a random element in X is in the language or not. Conversely, um, in the Pellier crypto system, which relies on the decisional composite residuosity assumption, knowing the factorization of N actually makes the problem easy. So if we use an encryption scheme from hash proof systems, our simulator can use the secret key and it won't compromise security. So, now I can present our two-party protocol. It's very similar to that of Lindell's, except for the aforementioned changes. So player one and player two each sample a random share of X. Of X. Um, they can perform a simulatable Diffie-Hellman key exchange to set up the public key Q. Then P1 is going to sample um, the secret and public key for the encryption scheme from hash proof systems. It encrypts X1, sends this encryption of X1 along with a proof that it knows the encrypted value X1 and the randomness used for encryption, and that the encrypted value is indeed the same X1 as that used to compute Q. Both parties store the public key Q, their share of X. P1 also stores his decryption key, and P2 also stores the encryption of X1 that it got from P1. Um, and then in order to sign a message, each um, party samples their share of K, they perform a simulatable Diffie-Hellman key exchange to set up the randomness R. Um, P2 can compute an encryption of S prime and um, send this to P1. P2 decrypts, multiplies by his share of K, um, and verifies the signature. If it's valid, it outputs it, otherwise it aborts. Okay, so to prove security in this setting, so for a two-party ECDSA protocol, what we do is we demonstrate that if a party alone can forge signatures, then a simulator, which is going to simulate the environment for this corrupted player, can output a signature 
a forgery for a standard ECDSA. And so we reduced the security of the two-party protocol to that of standard ECDSA. So um, in standard ECDSA, a forger gets as input a public key Q, which is X times P, and it has access to an oracle um, for, which will sign messages of its choice, and then it has to output a message and a signature which it didn't get from its oracle. So if I denote um, PI star, our um, corrupted party for the two-party protocol, if our simulator can set up the same public key Q as it got as input from, um, like from its challenge, then every time the corrupted player asks to collaboratively sign a message with the simulator, it can just request a signature of this message from its oracle, and then it's going to simulate the signing phase to output the same signature as it received from its oracle. And now if our party PI star outputs a forgery for the two-party protocol, since they set up the same public key, um, the simulator can use this forgery as its own forgery, and he's broken standard ECDSA. So I'll now justify the security of our scheme. Um, so I'll only talk about the part where our techniques kick in, which is when we're considering a corrupted player two, and so we need to simulate player one. So um, the simulator gets as input this public key Q. It can simulate the Diffie-Hellman key exchange with the corrupted player two. And from this simulated Diffie-Hellman key exchange, it can extract the value X2 that was input by player two. Then the simulator samples a secret key and a public key for the encryption scheme. And notice that it doesn't actually know the value X such that Q is equal to X times P. And so it doesn't know the X1 that it should be sending an encryption of to P2. So it just samples a random X1 star, encrypts this value, and sends it along with a simulated proof to the corrupted player two. Um, and then they store the values that they were meant to store. And so this is where the indistinguishability of the um, encryption scheme is important because our simulator is just sending the encryption of a random value. Next, to simulate the signing step, um, so P2 asks to sign a message M. The simulator is going to request a signature of this message from its oracle, RS. From this signature, it can extract the randomness R used for, for the signature. And then it can perform the simulated Diffie-Hellman key exchange with the corrupted player two in order to set up the same randomness R and it extracts the value K2 that was input by P2. And now when it gets the encrypted value C prime from the corrupted player two, it can decrypt using the secret key which it's now allowed to decrypt to use um, and check that uh, player two performs the correct operations. If so, it um, returns the signature that it received from its oracle, and if not, it aborts. So thanks to this simple change, we don't need to guess if player two cheats. We don't need to use any non-standard or interactive assumptions. And yeah, that's it. So now that I've shown how to get rid of the uh, strange assumption, let's now see how we can remove range proofs. So to do this, we need an encryption scheme which relies on hash proof systems, which has a prime order message space, where we can actually choose this order to be the order of the uh, group of points of the elliptic curve, which is used for ECDSA. So this isn't common, but we can achieve this from uh, the framework, which was introduced by Casenio San Legiomi at CTRSA 2015. So that of a group with an easy discrete logarithm subgroup. So we have a cyclic group G, of order Q times S, where the GCD of Q and S is one. Q is a large prime, and we have a subgroup F of G generated by little f, which is of order Q, and another subgroup GQ, which consists of the Qth powers in G, which is of order S. And we require that the discrete logarithm problem be easy in F. In this framework, Gasenio, uh, Slegiomi, and myself introduced a the HSM hard subgroup membership problem, which essentially states that it's hard to distinguish um, random elements of the group G from random elements of the subgroup GQ. Um, so from, if I compare to the framework of uh, Kramer and Chou that I talked about earlier, so here the language is uh, GQ and the whole group is the group G 
And um, so if we, a witness for an element in the language is going to be a W such that X is GQ to the power of W. And so we can create a linearly homomorphic encryption scheme from uh, this setting. And the secret key doesn't help distinguish Q powers in G. Um, Castaño and La Yumi also provided a concrete instantiation for this framework from class groups. So here, um, K is our uh, imaginary quadratic field of uh, discriminant delta K. And if we choose uh, this discriminant to be divisible by Q, um, then denoting O delta, uh, the non-maximal order of discriminant Q squared delta K, then we can exhibit a cyclic group of order Q in, this, in the class group of this non-maximal order where the discrete logarithm problem is easy. Um, and in this setting, the security uh, of solving the HSM assumption that I talked of earlier reduces to the problem of computing the class number. And best number, the best known algorithms, sorry, for this problem uh, are, have complexity L1 half as opposed to L1 third for uh, factorization or discrete logarithm in traditional finite fields. So in particular, this means that we can use shorter elements um, than those used in the Belly encryption scheme, which further reduces um, communication cost. Uh, so we implemented both our scheme and, I mean, our protocol and that of Lindell um, to compare speed and bandwidth. So, um, yeah, in terms of speed for lower levels of security, we're slower, but the more you increase security, the better we perform. And in terms of bandwidth, we do consistently better. Um, so to conclude, uh, we provided a generic two-party ECDSA protocol from hash proof systems where we don't have any interactive or non-standard assumptions. Uh, there's one thing that I didn't really mention is that the zero knowledge proof isn't completely um, generic. It kind of depends on the um, instance of hash proof system that we use. And we provide an instantiation in class groups, um, which is practical and has very low bandwidth. Um, and we're currently working on um, extending this to the full threshold setting. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions. All right, thank you, Ida. Um, we would have time for only a quick question, if you have one, at the mic while the next speaker sets up. Okay, there's no question. That's thank you again. <laughs>